Okay, so let's get started. So the presentation that I'm going to be giving you today is, um, like Daniel said, Monitoring Monarchs and Milkweed in New Brunswick. So a little bit of an overview about what are monarchs and why they're so significant here, um, what the relationship with milkweed is, and then how we as citizens around New Brunswick can do our part in protecting them for years to come. So who are we at Nature NB? Nature NB is a nonprofit charitable organization whose mission it is to celebrate, conserve, and protect New Brunswick's natural heritage through education, networking, and collaboration. And what's all the hype about with monarchs? Because I'm sure, you know, most people here have, have heard of monarchs at least, or, you know, to the extent are potentially very familiar with them. So monarchs are unique amongst butterflies and other insects in terms of their long distance travel. Each year, huge swaths of monarchs traverse thousands of kilometers across North America. Out of the millions of insects on Earth, no other is known to make a biannual migration quite like the monarch, and scientists still aren't quite sure exactly how they're able to do it. Tragically, monarch numbers have plummeted over the last 20 years, with the population declining by over 80% in that time frame. In 2016, Canada listed monarchs as an endangered species. Um, so without intervention, they unfortunately are likely to become extinct. So a little bit about the monarch life cycle. They undergo a complete metamorphosis, so egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly in about four weeks. And the summer monarchs live roughly three to six weeks, which is basically just enough time for them to lay their eggs, uh, which creates the next generation. And there are generally three to four generations of summer monarchs. Now, that's an important term, the summer monarchs, because in contrast, the fall monarch, monarch which is the migratory generation, is kind of like a super monarch. It's bigger and stronger, and it actually lives eight months or more. Now the 500 or 5,000 kilometer journey. So early August through mid-October, as the temperature starts to drop and days become shorter, Eastern monarchs enter an energy conserving state that's called diapause, and this allows them to begin their migration. They'll reach their destination in November to late December, which is high up in the Sierra Madre mountain range in central Mexico. And it's there that they spend their winters tucked away in the cool OML fur forest amongst the clouds. Come March, they become active again and start their flight towards Texas and the southern US. The butterflies are on their search for milkweed, where they'll lay their eggs and then their long journey ends. So it's only the second or third generation of migrating butterflies that'll make it back to Canada. So if you picture the monarchs down here, in central Mexico, they might, you know, the monarchs that, that have come from New Brunswick will make it all the way down to Mexico. And then they overwinter there. And then those same monarchs will make it, you know, they might make it to Texas, Louisiana kind of area where they lay their eggs and then they die, unfortunately, but such is the circle of life. And then the next generation, could potentially make it all the way to New Brunswick, um, but more likely it's going to be that the, the second or third generation that makes it back. So they kind of make it back up this far north incrementally, feeding as they go and developing in the, in the places that they lay their eggs. And um, Daniel mentioned in my intro that uh, I migrated down to Belize and then back again um, actually last year and I drove all the way from Belize so my migration was similar to the monarchs migration and driving from Belize to New Brunswick was an incredibly long drive and a beautiful one but it, it kind of um, for me makes it that more incredible to think of the monarchs migration it really is something else so now we'll talk about So not surprisingly, climate change is a big threat. I mean, this is something that is facing a lot of species. 
Climate change is changing plant blooming times, which affects butterflies and other pollinators. It's also altering timing for migration um, through temperature changes. So um, though the migration of monarchs isn't 100% understood, a lot of it does have to do with daylight and temperature changes during those fall months as the caterpillars are developing. Um, and so with temperature changes, we, we don't really know the impacts that that could have with the migration, um, but certainly they're not going to be positive ones. Um, another way that climate change is affecting migration is through um, stronger and more frequent hurricanes like you know, we just had a near miss here and it's peak migration time right now. So for large swaths of monarchs that are trying to make it back down south, a hurricane could completely derail that for them. We also have habitat loss. Again, not a surprising one, um, facing a lot of species. So milkweed and nectaring flowers are declining as landscapes are mowed and develop. Monarchs are also losing um, are also experiencing loss of their wintering grounds in Mexico, which we'll talk about in a second here. And then the last one, the last big one I should say, is pesticide use. So pesticides are, as we know, indiscriminate and also affect many vertebrates as they move through the food web. So they're not only affecting insects, but the insectivores and larger predators as well. Okay, so this is a, a really interesting graph I find of um, the monarch population in those OML fir forests in the Sierra Madre mountain range in central Mexico. So one of the reasons that we're able to um, so accurately describe the population of monarchs is because they come to a relatively small area within Mexico and, and that's not common for a lot of insect species. So understanding how many we have left, left is a little bit easier with monarchs than maybe some other species of butterfly or other insects. So you can see the picture here on the right is of um, some of these OML fir trees in Mexico and the monarchs absolutely flock to these trees in almost unimaginable numbers. And um, there'll be so many monarchs on um, one of these boughs on the fir trees that the, the boughs actually begin to bend under the weight of this insect, which is kind of mind blowing when you think of it. So looking at this graph, we can see from 1995 all the way to 2019, the um, amount of monarchs in terms of hectares occupied by um, these like mass coverings. So um, the highest year was in the winter of 1996-1997 where we had over 18 hectares. The lowest year has been 2013-2014 where there was less than one hectare, just over half, 0.67 hectares um, of that coverage of monarchs. And um, it's thought that a sustained population would be around six hectares. So that's the target for monarch recovery. And 2018, 2019 actually had a really good season where there was 6.05 hectares coverage. But unfortunately, the 2019, 2020 season, we went back down again um, with only 2.83 hectares covered. So now talking a little bit about milkweed. First of all, what is milkweed and what's the relationship with monarchs? Why is it so important? Milkweed is the host plant for monarchs, which means that monarch caterpillars feed exclusively on milkweed. The name comes from the milky white substance released from the stems when, and leaves when they're broken. Uh, this sap contains a compound called uh, a, a cardiac glycoside, and that actually makes the caterpillars toxic to birds and other predators. And one really interesting thing about that is that, um, and as I'm sure anyone, this is one of the kind of fun facts about monarchs. So um, a lot of people know that 
not only is the caterpillar toxic to birds and other predators, but the caterpillar actually maintains that toxin within itself um, as it transforms into a butterfly. So the butterflies are toxic as well. What's really interesting is that there's many different species of milkweed, as we're, we'll talk about shortly here. Um, but the southern monarchs that stay more in like the southern United States are generally feeding on milkweed that has a higher level of this cardiac glycoside than the species of milkweed that we have here in New Brunswick do. So southern, milk, southern monarchs are actually toxic but northern monarchs probably are just going to taste bad to predators regardless it's that kind of like herd um, or population uh, toxicity that deters predators in general so the the northern monarchs benefit from their very toxic southern monarch counterparts um, what's also really interesting about milkweed is that the genus name which is Asclepius actually stems from uh, Asclepios, which who was the Greek god of medicine. So it is considered a medicinal plant and was used traditionally um, to um, combat a variety of different ailments. So we're talking about species of milkweed in New Brunswick now. The first one is common milkweed. Um, and you can see it here in this top right hand corner and then the leaf here and the seed pod in the lower picture and not surprisingly common milkweed is more commonly found growing in New Brunswick than the other species of milkweed we have here. So if we're looking at how to identify common milkweed we look at things like the height of the plant, so it can be up to 2.5 meters, usually it's around 5 feet or so, it can be a little bit shorter than that. Um, the leaves are really distinctive, they're wide oval shaped leaves, they can be up to 25 centimeters long and they have this noticeable central vein and then smaller veins running towards the edges um, and a very rounded tip and the underside of the leaf is um, really kind of um, I want to say velvety, but maybe a little bit more like suede, like like it, it's soft and a little bit fuzzy on the underside. The stem is non-branching except for at the very top. So you have this one main shoot and then leaves coming off of it. And it, it's not really a branching plant like you might see in different shrubs and other um, quote unquote weeds. Um, the bloom is pinkish purple and will last for up to six weeks in early to midsummer. And the flowers are really beautiful. You can see this is the other species, swamp milkweed, here. And you can see the flower a little bit better. The flower shape is very similar. The color is a little bit different from one species to the next. Um, but the flower itself is uh, one of the most complex flowers in, um, in, among flowering plants. So it's a really beautiful flower. And you can smell milkweed too, the, it, it smells really floral and fragrant. Um, and then we have the seed pod. So the seed pod is between six and 12 centimeters in length, and it has this kind of knobbly, prickly exterior. Um, it's not actually like prickly to the touch, but it has these um, kind of soft prickles. Of, that's kind of an oxymoron, but hopefully you know what I mean. And the other species that we have here in New Brunswick is swamp milkweed. So swamp milkweed grows, it's, it's not quite as tall, it grows up to 1.5 meters. The leaves you can see um, are probably the, the biggest difference between the swamp milkweed and the common milkweed. Um, they're a lot shorter, um, they're a lot narrower and they, they taper to a sharp point at the end. Um, the stem might branch, but um, not, not, again, not as much as you would see in another kind of flowering shrub or something like that. And the bloom is a little bit more pinky than the common milkweed bloom is. And uh, it'll bloom usually for about four weeks in mid to late summer. So it blooms a little bit later than the common milkweed does.
Um, something else to note about them, um, which I mentioned before, but if you're if you're trying to identify common versus swamp milkweed or, or wondering whether something's a milkweed in general, a really surefire way of being able to um, accurately identify at least that it's a milkweed is if you um, break one of the leaves, just kind of crack the leaf open, um, that white milky sap will come out immediately and, and that's a really quick easy way to make sure that what you're looking at is in fact milkweed. Um, I should note that, you know, we talked about the, the sap toxicity to monarch predators. Um, it's not something that's very nice to get on your skin, so avoid touching the sap. And if you're ever handling um, common or swamp milkweed, make sure you're washing your hands straight afterwards. Um, don't touch your eyes, don't touch your mouth. We should be used to, to washing hands and not touching faces at this point. Um, you know, with the pandemic and whatnot, but it, it's, it is important to mention with uh, milkweed particularly as well. Um, oh, and then we have the seed pod for this one too. So the seed pod is a little bit smaller and it, it has a smooth texture rather than a rough one like common milkweed does. Okay, so um, I can switch back to the group chat here. Um, I have a little bit of a pop quiz, so you can write in the chat comments. Um, do we think that this is swamp milkweed or common milkweed? Okay, so seeing a couple different answers. So again, we're looking at, I think anyways, for me, the, the easiest way to tell is the leaf. So um, again, with common milkweed, we have those big, wide, long leaves with rounded edges. And then with swamp milkweed, we have um, narrower, shorter leaves that come to um, a point at the end. So I'm seeing a lot of swamp, and it is in fact swamp milkweed. Oops. There you go. Okay, next one. So we have a field of milkweed here, but what kind of milkweed do we have? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of comment or comments come up in the the chat, and and yeah, it is in fact common milkweed. So again, we have those. Um, really wide oval shaped leaves. Um, and you can tell really well in this picture too, the difference in the bloom color. So um, the bloom color for common milkweed is almost kind of like a, like a mauve -y, in my opinion. Like it definitely has more of a purplish tinge than pink, whereas the swamp milkweed, it is a really bright pink bloom. Okay. Last quiz. Okay, and what do we have here? Okay, so I'm seeing some swamp. <laughs> is this a trick from Michelle? Yeah, Michelle is correct in guessing that I'm tricking everyone and that it's actually Joe Pie weed. Um, and the reason that I put this in here um, is not to be malicious <laughs> in any way, um, but it's something that um, a lot of our staff here in starting um, this Monarch project, we had to get used to. This is a really common um, plant that grows wild in New Brunswick and a lot of the same areas uh, that, that um, common milkweed would especially, um, but it, it looks really similar to a milkweed. It's not in fact a, a milkweed at all. So um, some of the ways that you can tell the difference between Joe Pye weed and swamp and common milkweed are the fact that um, Joe Pye has these jagged leaf edges rather than smooth leaf, smooth leaf edges. Um, 
it's a different flower structure. So from a distance, the flowers look incredibly similar, but up close, um, you really can tell the difference in the flower structure. And if you break one of those leaves, you're not going to see the milky sap. Um, another way too, and I'll just kind of go back a couple of slides to show you this, Oops. that I didn't really mention, is swamp milkweed has leaves, and actually common as well, the leaves all the way up the stem grow parallel to each, each other. So you'll have a leaf here and a leaf here coming off the stem. And you can see that's the same um, here with the common milkweed as well. With Joe Pye, um, the leaves don't grow parallel to each other. They grow in um, kind of uh, bushels of five leaves coming off of the stem all the way up the plant. So that's another great way to tell what exactly you're looking at. Um, so now uh, we've moved on to the portion of the presentation about taking action. So. What are some simple things that you can do starting today even um, to help bolster the population of monarchs here in New Brunswick? So we have monarch friendly gardening. That's a great one, especially for anyone who's already gardening. What are some things that you can do to just make your garden that much more friendly to monarchs specifically? Um, collecting milkweed seeds, which we'll talk about and contributing to citizen science. So I think this is a citizen science, it's a really popular um, conservation tool right now. And um, there are a lot of options for citizen science with Monarch. So I'll touch on a few of those projects that we really recommend. So Monarch friendly gardening. Gardening with Monarchs in mind can go a long way in ensuring their continued presence here in New Brunswick and beyond. So there's some simple things that you can do to your garden um, or community gardens that make them extra friendly to Monarchs. The first is, not surprisingly, plant milkweed. <laughs> so milkweed, I mean, it's inextricable from Monarchs. They need it to survive. Um, and the more milkweed we have, the better chance that uh, monarchs will thrive here in New Brunswick and we'll be able to, you know, start off on a great foot or I guess wing, if you will, for their migration south. Um, the next thing that you can do is use native flowers um, instead of non-native flowers that you would buy um, at your local greenhouse. Um, a lot of green, most greenhouses have a wide selection of native flowers and the reason reason that we recommend using native flowers is just because they're so much more robust for um, this climate here. The temperatures here, the rainfall amounts, the soil types, they're a lot more resilient to um, pests that we have in New Brunswick. Um, so you'll eliminate your need for using pesticides, which are really <laughs> detrimental to monarchs and any other benefit, um, beneficial pollinator or other insects like ladybugs that you actually want in your garden because these pesticides don't differentiate the pests from the beneficial insects. So back to um, milkweed and native flowers, you want to have a kind of a good mix between um, host plants and nectar plants. Um, adult monarchs will use milkweed apart from just laying their eggs. Um, they'll drink the nectar from milkweed flowers as well. So uh, the milkweed kind of doubles as a host plant and a nectar plant when it's in bloom, but there are a lot of other native flowers um, and non-native flowers actually that um, monarchs will feed from as adults. So another thing that you can do is leave a bare patch of soil amongst your flowers for uh, puddling behavior, which is demonstrated in this picture. And these aren't monarchs, they're Canadian swallowtail, tiger swallowtail butterflies. Um, so uh, a lot of different butterfly species will get a lot of the minerals uh, and nutrients that they need from the soil. And so they'll drink kind of like muddy water on the ground, which doesn't seem very butterfly-like, but it is a really important um, aspect of, of, of um, their behavior in life. 
Um, another thing that you can do if you don't want to leave a muddy patch of ground in your garden is include a shallow water dish as long as you're making sure that that's being cleaned regularly or at least tipped over and kind of given a, a quick scrub out. Um, and in terms of, uh, of uh, any reticence to leave a bare patch of soil amongst, amongst your flowers for mud puddling, when we talk about wildlife friendly gardens, generally speaking, having a garden that's a little bit more unkempt or a little bit less manicured is in general um, a little bit more appealing to wildlife. So keep that in mind. It kind of gives you an excuse to skip the mowing and the raking leaves every once in a while if you're okay with that. Um, another important thing to do um, when you're planning your garden is to try to stagger the emergence or, and a lot of people will do this anyways just, um, just so that they have flowers all season long, but staggering the emergence of flower blooms will ensure that uh, the butterflies, the pollinators, the, the monarchs in particular who are visiting your garden will have a steady supply of, um, of nectar all season long. And then the last one, um, keep cats indoors. I'm, I'm a big cat lover, but my cats only get to enjoy um, the birds and the butterflies that visit our garden from the, um, the view through the window because cats are um, one of the, the biggest um, offenders in, in um, our plummeting songbird population here in Canada and and they don't just like birds they like a lot of other wildlife including catching butterflies so um, I should mention here and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide as well that um, you can sign up for nature and bees milkweed seed mail out on our website so we send um, mainly swamp milkweed seeds that are collected by the St. John Naturalist Club every fall. Um, and we send them out throughout New Brunswick and, and beyond really um, for free. So anyone who wants to plant milkweed in their garden, that's a great way to obtain swamp milkweed. Um, and the reason that we send out swamp milkweed instead of common milkweed primarily is because um, Milkweed, the, it's, it's a little bit disheartening to call it a weed um, because it, it's a really beautiful plant and it looks beautiful in a garden. Um, but um, maybe the reason that it's, that it's called, it's named a weed, I suppose, is because it really does have uh, a tendency to spread very quickly. So um, common milkweed has a root system that will send up these little shoots and runners and, and, and take over an area um, relatively quickly. So if you don't have a lot of room in your garden, you don't want common milkweed taking over, a, a good uh, alternative is planting swamp milkweed. It has a, a different root system. It doesn't tend to spread as much. It'll stay where you plant it. So you avoid the issue of having um, your lawn turn into uh, a milkweed field, which would be great for the butterflies, but it's not everybody's cup of tea. So now talking a little bit more about um, milkweed and seed collection. So if you'd like to be involved on the flip side and not just be sent uh, milkweed seeds, but you have milkweed potentially already growing in your garden, or you know of a field near you where you'd be willing to go and harvest milkweed seeds. That's something that, um, that we are looking for um, and the St. John Naturalist Club is looking for, for help. So the St. John Naturalist Club collects and packages milkweed seeds. Then they send those to us and then we take care of the mailing list and mailing them um, to anyone who signed up on our website to receive seeds. Since 2019, when this initiative started, we've sent over 2,500 swamp milkweed seed packages, which actually translates to nearly 200,000 individual seeds. So hopefully this is doing a lot for bolstering 
milkweed populations and in turn monarch populations here around the province. So you can collect seeds from either native species, milk, swamp milkweed or common milkweed. And you can tell that seeds are ready for harvest when the seed pod cracks open. So um, here's a common milkweed seed pod in this lower picture here. And you can see in the top right hand corner um, that the seed pod is cracked open and the seeds have um, some down attached to them. They're not unlike dandelion seeds where the uh, the, the reason for that down is for them to be dispersed by the wind. But we don't really want that down for planting. So um, if you can, you can separate the down um, just by hand or it's recommended to put some seeds with the down in a paper bag and, a, and have a, little, a few coins inside and give that a gentle shake and that'll help with separating some of the down so that you end up with seeds that look like um, the picture in the top left hand corner. Um, a fun fact about milkweed down, it's apparently five times warmer than wool and it's being farmed um, intentionally in, uh, in Quebec uh, to be used for a, a variety of different um, reasons. Um, one of them is a, a vegan alternative to goose down for winter jackets and, and warm clothes. Um, another another reason that it's being used is um, for um, soundproofing cars and buildings and things like that because it's so lightweight and works really well for that apparently. Um, it's also buoyant and I think it was used um, at, during the Second World War for life jacket stuffing. So there's some really neat history with that and potential for future innovation um, using milkweed seed down. Okay, so now a little bit about monarch citizen science. So how you can make a difference with that. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, citizen science descri describes data collection or observation by the general public in collaboration with scientists and scientific institutions. By recording your monarch and milkweed observations through the following citizen science sites, you'll be contributing directly to the research and conservation of monarchs. So we're gonna talk about iNaturalist, Mission Monarch, Milkweed Watch, and Monarch Watch. So coming back to the chat here, has, oh, I'm seeing a friend of mine has a jacket and loves it. Oh, that's really interesting, Tanya. Or Tanya. I, um, I'd love to see that. I, I've never heard of anyone actually having one of these jackets. I'd, I'd love to know whether they're actually as warm as people, as they, they claim to be. Um, so just a really quick poll, um, because I know I heard Daniel mention it um, before I started my presentation, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a common theme throughout a lot of these webinars. Um, how many people are familiar with iNaturalist? Are there a lot of iNaturalist users that are logged in? Great app, yes, yeah. Beginner user. Okay, so we have some users here. So I'll give a quick overview. I'm gonna go through these citizen science applications, specifically talking about how they can be used um, to contribute to Monarch research. Um, and kind of go over some of the pros and cons um, of each um, website or application. So iNaturalist is a free citizen science app that helps you identify the living organisms around you. And this applies, you can use for anyone who doesn't know, iNaturalist is not exclusive to monarchs. You can use it for um, IDing um, and uploading any living species. Um, and it works worldwide as well. Um, you can connect with scientists and other naturalists to learn more about nature, and your observations create data for scientists who are working to better understand and protect nature. So the pros of iNaturalist, first and foremost, I think a huge pro is that um, 
it runs on a, a really great mobile application and um, it's Android and iPhone friendly um, so you can have it literally in your back pocket at all times um, and uploading observations is really quick the next really great pro for iNaturalist is that if you don't know what you're looking at the app itself will give you suggestions and then beyond that other naturalists once you've uploaded your um, your suggestion or your observation other naturalists can agree with your identification or suggest another identification um, and the app is really quick and easy um, I actually use I use iNaturalist all the time for things that I don't know so it, it's really um, the benefit is really reciprocal for iNaturalist. Not only are users uploading really important data to um, the database, but also uh, iNaturalist is um, kind of teaching the users more about the uh, the natural world around them. So, and and it's it's the most popular citizen science app. So, um, something that like maybe. Um, puts people off a little bit on some of these citizen science apps is, you know, if if you say, well, your observations can be, um, you know, agreed with or you can have different suggestions by other naturalists. Well, there has to be other users for that to actually work. And with iNaturalist, there are. So it's really fun to see when you upload something that you don't know what it is or you're not sure um, and you see other people engaging with you and agreeing with your identification or giving you an identification a little bit beyond maybe at the species level where you only knew um, the family of organisms that you were identifying. Um, it's a really great app in that way and, and you can learn a lot from it. One of the cons in terms of probably the, the, only, the only con if you can even call it that, um, for Monarch um, data collection with iNaturalist is that because it's so quick and easy to use, you don't really get um, a big picture in terms of what's going on with the, the data. So if I were to upload a photo of a common milkweed plant with iNaturalist, there's not really the capability to say whether I've seen one common milkweed plant or if I'm taking a picture of a common milkweed plant in the middle of a field of, you know, that's a football field size, all of common milkweed. So it's really a snapshot of that specific organism that you're uploading um, and, and doesn't give researchers as much information um, about the area that you've seen um, the specific species in as some of the other um, citizen science applications that we'll we'll talk about in a second here. So iNaturalist, for anyone who doesn't use it, it it's got a really simple interface. Um, when you download the app and bring it up on your phone, usually um, it starts with the explore screen here. So if you wanted to see, okay, well, where, where was the last monarch butterfly seen near me? You could type in monarch butterfly. Well, you wouldn't type in monarch butterfly. You just type in monarch um, in the search bar here, and it'll bring up observations of that species. Um, if you want to share your own observations, you click on the little observe icon here at the bottom. And... Um, that will take you to this screen here. And you can either decide to take a photo through the app or upload um, a photo from your, um, your phone photo album. Um, so here you can see I've uploaded a photo of a chickadee, a black cap chickadee. And if I click, what did you see here in the middle of this screen? The app's gonna provide me with some suggestions. So it's suggesting that um, it thinks that it's in the chickadee genus, but it's not quite sure what the exact species is. I know this is a black cap chickadee, but if I didn't know, I could look below and say, okay, well, it's suggesting a black cap chickadee um, because it's visually similar and they've been seen close by. So that's probably the most likely situation. So you could click on the species that it's suggestion suggesting or you could just click the genus and then let the other users that are interacting with your posts uh, maybe suggest 
what kind of animal they think it is at the species specific level. So back to this um, uh, middle photo here with the observed screen. Um, some of the other features um, and information that the app will gather um, are the date and time that the photo was taken. Um, and then that, that's added automatically based on the metadata on your photo. Um, same with the location. The geo privacy. So if you don't want anyone to know where you've taken this photo or seen this animal or organism, um, you can actually change the geo privacy from open where people can see the exact location that you've made that observation to um, closed or I think the other op um, option is limited. So it'll give kind of a general area but won't, won't say exactly where. Um, whether or not the species is captive or cultivated. Um, this is important if you were to add your garden milkweed. So if you're finding swamp milkweed in the wild, um, nearby, you know, on a trail that you walk frequently, you would put no for captive or cultivated. If you're actually growing that swamp milkweed in your yard um, and you've planted it intentionally, you can put that it's a, a captive or for plants would be a cultivated species. Um, so that's that's that in terms of observation. So there's there's a lot of really good information there, but um, you can, you do have the ability to add a little bit more through the app. So um, if I were uploading an observation of, of again common milkweed, I might want to add um, you know say something in the notes about this was one plant um, in a field of approximately 50 or whatever it might be. So, you know, you have that option to give a little bit more information, but it's still not to the extent of, of some of the other um, applications that we'll be looking at. Um, another really great, oh, sorry, share and confirm. <laughs> so I got ahead of myself a little bit here. So the next screen, when um, you click share, brings you to your observation. So this is an observation that I uploaded of common milkweed. And um, other folks who are using the app are able to um, suggest um, actual species identification. Actually, this wasn't me who uploaded this. This was someone who uploaded a photo of common milkweed. And they weren't sure exactly what it was. So they had identified it. They knew that it was a flowering plant. So they they kind of lumped it in the category of the subphylum angiospermae. And then other users came on and they said, hey, that's common milkweed. So they added identifications. You can see there's three folks here who um, suggested uh, common milkweed as an identification. Okay, so another really interesting feature of iNaturalist is the project feature. So Nature and Bee has set up a, a project called Monarchs and Milkweed in New Brunswick. And automatically any, um, we've set kind of a geo fence, if you will, around New Brunswick. And anyone who uploads um, swamp milkweed, common milkweed, or uh, a monarch, egg, caterpillar, adult butterfly, chrysalis, any kind of, well, any kind of monarch, any <laughs> monarch, regardless of its life stage, um, it automatically gets lumped into this project here. So you can see, since we've set this project up last year, there's been 477 observations, three species, not surprisingly, and eight, 182 observers. So 182 different people who have contributed to this project. So you can check this project out by um, going to more, down at the bottom of the application, and then uh, it'll give you an option to click projects, and then you can search the project name. You can join the project so that you can um, receive updates about that project, but regardless of whether you've joined it or not, any observation that you upload that fits the parameters of this project will be automatically um, linked to the project. So I gotta speed up a little bit here. <laughs> Um, so the next citizen science platform that I'll mention is Mission Monarch. Mission Monarch encourages members of the public to survey wild and cultivated milkweed patches for evidence of monarchs as part of an international research and education effort aimed at saving the migratory population of this endangered species. 
So one of the pros, the data is really easily accessible. This doesn't have an app, so if you go on the website, um, and Mission Monarch, I should mention, is run for a uh, run through Espace pour la Vie and Sectarium in Montreal. Um, so if you go on the Mission Monarch website, you can um, actually look at the data really easily and request to access the Excel forms of that data. Um, Mission Monarch is the Canadian organizer of the International Monarch Monitoring Blitz, which happens every year in late July. And it's a week-long period where across um, the United States and Canada and, and, and northern Mexico, um, people are going out and surveying monarch populations. Um, so it's a, it's a really great international initiative that gives a really good snapshot of where monarchs are from year to year, um, from year to year during that specific time. Um, and the other pro about this one is there's a lot of bilingual resources and training available. So if you wanted to um, participate in a mission or run your own mission, which is just to say going out to a milkweed patch to observe um, and survey uh, monarch presence, um, Mission Monarch has training opportunities for you to be able to do that confidently. So looking at um, what other um, caterpillars uh, use milkweed fields that might be uh, confused with um, um, monarch caterpillars, um, how to tell between uh, a um, first stage instar, which is something we didn't really get into, but the different stages of the caterpillar in the life cycle. Um, how to tell between a monarch butterfly and a viceroy, which is a monarch mimic. Um, so there's a lot of really great training that's available through Mission Monarch. And if you wanted to actually devote a chunk of time to survey a milkweed field, um, this is a really great option for doing that. So we participated as the New Brunswick organizers of the International Monarch Monitoring Blitz this July, and um, there were 46 blitzes conducted in New Brunswick. Um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. We we had some you know really great people come out, and um, a lot of a lot of participation right across the province in that. So the next um, citizen science platform is Milkweed Watch. And now we're really getting um, a little bit less convenient, maybe a little bit less user friendly, but a lot of really great data. So if you get really interested in Monarch citizen science, this might be your second or third step even. So Milkweed Watch, it's a citizen science pro program within the Nature Watch platform, which is a, a Canadian platform. And Milkweed Watch allows members of the public to help monitor and log the presence and abundance of milkweed specifically. So we're not looking so much for monarch, we're just looking at um, the presence of milkweed, which is obviously important to their conservation. Um, so the pros are that it's really compre comprehensive, um, and it is mobile friendly, even though they don't have a specific app. So some of the information that they're looking for when you um, fill out a milkweed watch observation form is um, general things like the date that you observed the milkweed patch, the species of milkweed that you were observing. And then we get into more specific things like the number of plants. So like they'll give you a drop down menu to, I think there's one plant, two to 10, so which is a small, small patch of plants, um, 10 to 50, 50 to 100, that kind of thing. Um, the event, so you can say whether they're not flowering, whether they're mid-bloom, whether they've gone to seed, the evidence of monarchs, so did you actually see any monarch caterpillars, any eggs, any adults feeding from the nectar, um, where the plants are found, and again, this will give you another drop-down menu, so you can pick urban park or public space, I think there's um, like a riverine em environment, um, different kind of options like that. Um, whether you've observed any uh, the milkweed previously at this location, and then they give you an option to upload a photo, which isn't necessarily so, uh, necessary either. Um, and then the other option is to add some notes. So you can say whether um, 
the milkweed that you've planted has been, or uh, the milkweed that you've observed has been planted intentionally or any other kind of um, information that you think would be relevant. And the last um, citizen science platform is Monarch Watch. And this one is probably going to be the least relevant, relevant but if you have an opportunity to participate in a Monarch Watch tagging event, potentially the most fun <laughs> um, citizen science initiative. So Monarch Watch is a website that allows members of the public to submit sightings of tagged monarch butterflies. Um, or um, if you are um, experienced enough um, to lead tagging events. So if you see, if you ever see a monarch with a small white sticker on its wing right here, you can report it through Monarch Watch. Um, it's also a really good resource if you're growing milkweed. They have a lot of different resources on their website. And again, it's only relevant if you find a tag monarch. So um, just really quickly, the last New Brunswick tagging um, initiative through the St. John Naturalist Club happened at Point La Pro, and they do this every year. So it was Point La Pro this past Saturday, um, and it really marked the end of the season. You can see in this photo here, this was taken on Saturday as the monarch's getting ready to fly off again. Um, he landed on uh, Jenna, who's a member of the Nature and Beast uh, staff, on her face mask. So um, they were only able to actually catch one monarch and tag it throughout the whole day that they were there. Um, and that's because a lot of the wildflowers that are blooming at Point La Pro are starting to die off for the season. And so the monarchs aren't really stopping um, to feed at the point before flying off. So they didn't really have the opportunity. Even though they saw some more, they, didn't, they couldn't really catch any more. So it's really the end of season for any tagging initiatives here. Okay, so uh, really quickly, before we get to questions, I just wanted to acknowledge that this project is funded through the Environmental, or the Environment and Climate Change Canada, um, and the New Brunswick Wildlife Trust Fund, and their Conservation Plates Program. So, does anyone have any questions? And I should also mention that we have a lot of downloadable resources on Monarchs at our website, naturenb.ca slash monarchs. Okay. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> okay, so I see a comment that you don't need a smartphone to use INAT. I take photos and enter observations with my computer. That, that's a really good point to make. Um, the website actually for iNaturalist is even a little bit more um, powerful than the app, especially if you're looking for observations. So you do have the option to do everything through your computer if you don't have a smartphone. Um, but I do think that the fact that it has this great app with it where you can do everything through your phone is a lot more convenient for a lot of people who have their sm smartphone on them at all times, really. Okay, so I see some questions in the question section. So I'll start with the first one. Sorry if I missed this, but what time of year should you collect milkweed seeds? Um, right now is a, a, a great time to start collecting milkweed seeds. Not all of them will have, um, you should see the seed pods on most of the plants. Not all of the seed pods will have cracked open and are really ready for harvesting, but keep watching them because this is kind of the prime time for that. Um, and for anyone who wants to plant milkweed, that reminds me too, um, this is also a good time to be planting milkweed, um, surprisingly. <laughs> and that's because um, milkweed needs, the seed needs a period of cold and frost for it to actually germinate in the spring. So um, there's two ways if you want to plant milkweed seeds to plant. You can plant them directly in your garden this time of year in fall, or you can start them inside um, in kind of early spring and then plant them outside once they've sprouted. Um, 
if you're going to start them inside, you need to, and we have all of this information available when we send out the seed packs through Nature NB, um, but you actually need to put them in the fridge for four to six weeks. So you give them that kind of cold shock um, so that they're actually able to germinate. Um, next question, do monarch butterflies migrate broadly across the provinces or just through certain corridors areas? Makes sense to plant milkweed in some parts of the province more than others. Um, Cheryl, that's a really great question slash comment. Um, they, they do actually have certain corridors. Um, so the reason that the tagging takes place at Point La Pro is it's kind of like a send-off point in New Brunswick that a lot of monarchs seem to follow. Um, it's been noted or observed as well that in New Brunswick, a lot of the monarchs come up through kind of like the St. John area, again, where Point La Pro is, um, and they'll follow the St. John River up through the province. So for strategically planting milkweed and for protecting existing milkweed. Yeah, there are certain areas that would probably be a little bit more relevant um, to the conservation of monarchs, but we're kind of operating on under the, the um, assumption that the more milkweed that we can have in the province, the better, regardless of wherever it is. What ecosystem services do monarch butterflies provide? Are there any other species that depend on the monarch butterfly? Um, that's a really good question. So they are pollinators. They, they're important pollinators. I don't know of any other species that depend on the monarch butterfly. I think that the reason um, that monarchs have gotten, I'm, this is like a broader conservation question, and I don't want to go on too much of a tangent here, but they're quote unquote charismatic megafauna. So they're a species that people can really, they love, they've seen before, they've probably had an experience with monarchs as a child. It's a beautiful butterfly. It's our largest butterfly here in New Brunswick. Um, so there's a lot of um, um, care uh, uh, surrounding the monarch butterfly, apart from people who, who might not normally care as much about an insect species. Um, so they're kind of the, um, the banner holder for a lot of other insect and pollinator conservation in, in some ways. Um, is there any internationally agreed upon legislation similar to the Migratory Bird Act to protect the monarch through its migration? Um, that's a really good question and I think hopefully that's something that will come. Um, to my knowledge, there's a trinational monarch network, um, but I don't think as far as legislation goes, there's anything that protects monarchs on the same scale as the Migratory Bird Act. How, oh, and then the, the last question was um, for the Nature Trust from before. Will monarchs lay eggs on plants planted in their first year? I know they won't flower, but will they still host eggs? Um, actually, yes. And um, interestingly enough, that can actually be a problem for uh, the monarch caterpillars. Um, so monarch butterflies, for whatever reason, will actually lay their eggs on like tiny little milkweed seedlings. Um, and depending on where those seedlings are growing and what's around them, the, 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 the caterpillar might actually consume the entire plant and then have nothing left to feed on. So if you do plant milkweed in your garden and you are getting monarchs coming in, keep an eye on those. Um, and you could always move the caterpillars to a bigger milkweed field if it looks like they're kind of decimating their supply of milkweed in your garden. Great question. <laughs> so plant plenty of milkweed with a host of other native species. Yeah, that's really the idea. Um, and like I said, the milkweed functions as a host plant and a nectar plant, but only as long as it's blooming. So it is important to have other nectar um, flowering plants, nectar species that, the, that will attract the monarchs in um, so that they can lay their the eggs on the milkweed.
Okay, I think that's all the questions. All right, well, perfect. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, you guys are doing such amazing work uh, monitoring the monarchs in our province. And actually, before we transition, I do have one question myself. Um, and that's just for sources, if people are interested in actually buying milkweed. I've uh, looked around myself and it can be difficult trying to find Definitely, native species. Yeah. A lot of the local garden centers sell, you know, different non-native species that are more attractive and colorful. Um, so do you know of any suppliers in the southeast region that sell milkweed in, in bulk? Um, no. <laughs> so one thing that the seeds, I should say, some people are having trouble with germinating the seeds. Um, sometimes they can be a little bit finicky. Um, so one thing that we'd like to be able to do in, in future is to be able to send out seedlings. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, something, uh, uh, one species of milkweed that is really commonly carried by garden centers is butterfly weed. Um, and it, it looks quite a bit different. It is a milkweed species. It has an orange bloom and it, it's um, much more bushier. It doesn't get quite as tall. Um, and monarchs will lay their eggs on butterfly weed, but it doesn't tend to be the first pick. So if you have a garden, garden with butterfly weed, swamp milkweed and common milkweed, you're gonna get a lot more attention from monarchs on um, the swamp milkweed and the common milkweed. Something else that, um, I'm not sure if we have any listeners from Nova Scotia, but are there any listeners from Nova Scotia here? Does it, oh yes, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so we have a couple. Oh, actually a few, that's good. I'm glad that I um, can kind of quickly add this in. Common milkweed is still classified as a noxious weed in Nova Scotia. Um, and so technically you should not be planting common milkweed in Nova Scotia. Hopefully that um, um, classification will change because it, it is really an important species. There's actually over 450 insect species that feed to some description off of common milkweed. Um, but if you're in Nova Scotia, don't go planting common milkweed and, and tell people that Nature Envy told you to do so because technically um, that's not allowed. Swamp milkweed's still a go though. Awesome. Well, very interesting. Thank right. you so much again for your presentation.